Hello, welcome to the Flute 360 podcast, where we incorporate a panoramic view of flute related topics. I am your host, Heidi K. Begay, and this is episode 155 an interview with Pamela Sklar. Hi, welcome back to the Flute 360 podcast. These next four episodes, we are going to talk with four extraordinary composers in episodes 154 through 157. A little background information, these four musicians and I made contact through the Ultimate Music Business Summit hosted by Dr. Garrett Hope in January of 2021. Because of this event, I was able to make some wonderful music connections that have evolved into new friendships. This composer series brings me much joy because I get to share my new music friends with you. Learn from these aspiring musicians who give you gold nuggets that you can implement today. We talk about their flute compositions, how they perceive the flute voice, recording studio tips, and how to navigate a music career in our current climate. Lastly, I'd like to direct your attention to two great incentives that are going on right now. Flutistry Boston is giving you a 20% discount off of the book, Survival of the Flutist by Marion Gedigian, from now until March 31st, 2021. Use your Flute360 code today to receive your discount. Lastly, Elizabeth Talbert is giving you a 20% discount off of her book, Applied Flute Practice Technique, from now until May 7th, 2021, when you use your Flute360 code. Both links are provided in the show notes below. I would like to note that your purchase helps to support the Flute 360 podcast. If you would like to contribute to the podcast, this is a great way to do so. Thank you. Hi, Pam. Hi, Heidi. How are you? Good. Thank you. How are you doing? Uh, thank you. I'm doing really well. Thank you. I'm so happy to connect with you in, in person. Well, you know, two steps away. We're two thirds <laughs> in person, right? Because we're two dimensions out of three. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. nonetheless, we're still connecting and it's good to finally hear your voice after all of these different correspondences. Thank you. Likewise, it's great to hear your voice. It sounds somehow just like what I thought it would only because I realized when I had an image in my head, usually it's not right. But when I heard you interviewing, you know, a few other colleagues, your voice was the same as I had you know, before I heard you, but I thought so. There. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that fits. <laughs> That's good that there's some alignment there. <laughs> yes. I'm picking up the whole picture. Oh, you know. cool. Yeah. Well, I am so thrilled that our mutual friend put us in contact with each other. Yes. Oh, likewise. my. Yeah. I mean, my goodness. I just, I still get baffled and my mind gets blown when these connections have this um, domino effect in such a beautiful way. And all it was, was literally, uh, I presented at some summit, our friend reached out, said, you need to talk to Pamela. And then here we are. <laughs> oh, it's wonderful. Yes. And I did thank her so much because I, I think it's wonderful. See, I, I love connections and I love collaborating, which will come up in this conversation, I'm sure, a few more times. Yeah. And um, it's it's very nice. And sometimes I have that. I've connected people before and it just feels so good because you just know there is definitely a flow going on in, in terms of the personality, the nature, the direction they're going in and their goals or their, you know, similarities that you feel they really would be better if they knew each other. This would be a plus. Yeah, for it's sure. Great. I completely agree. Neat. So how is yes. your New York afternoon? Uh, it's nice. I took my daily walk. I love to walk, you know, it's just invigorating and it's so nice out right now. So I got to do that. Yeah. So it's been great. And, um, I trust yours was too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Busy morning. I got off the call, uh, just an hour ago with a flutist in Poland 
Nice. Oh, yeah. And we were talking about her new book, Flute Infinity, and she wrote it in Polish and in English. And I'm just, again, blown away by people's ambitions and projects that they are so passionate about. And when you get to come together and talk with a Polish flutist and then a New York based flutist like you, Pam, I'm just <laughs> I just sit yeah. here in shock and I go, this is my Tuesday morning. I mean, <laughs> right? <laughs> that's exciting because you're all over and you find the commonality. But yet, you know, the differences are very appealing. Mm -hmm. I like that, too. I like meeting people from from all over. Mm -hmm. You know, I met a flutist uh, from Moscow when I went to hear um, the Moscow Philharmonic and um, I went backstage back in the day when you could do that, you know, more easily. Um, and I spoke with him and I just asked him what kind of flute he had. He was playing a Haynes, an American flute. Hmm. And uh, he was wonderful. He understood me, my English. So it was just nice to connect and see that there we were doing the same things, but our worlds also were very different. Mm. Yeah. And I picked up and, on that when I listened to your description of, Words and music? Am I yes, saying that? Words. Yeah. Am words I... and music, yes. Yes. Um, and you talked about, you know, those relationships and uh, people's stories and how you love connecting with people all across the globe. And so I got that sense from you. And um, thank you for validating that for me. And just, I, I totally agree. Oh. I'm, I'm the same person. I just love different cultures and different walks of life. And it's a beautiful thing to celebrate. Oh, it is. It's great. And um, mentioning words into music, that was um, something so near and dear to me, to my heart, because I, I consider myself, my background, I, I just I just consider myself a collaborator because I love to work with people. I love to work closely um, and use the human element with music and how your life story, your situation, your path and your struggles and your dreams, all that connect to music and music reflects life and <laughs> you know, art is life, life is art in, in a certain way. Um, and that was an exciting project. If you want me to go into that now, I'm, I'm excited to do that. Yeah. Um, a little more detail. So um, it was a grant being offered to work um, with, I had a choice of two communities in Westchester County and I chose Mount Vernon um, and to create something new with community input. So I had the idea because I love to talk to people. I could talk for, for hours. There's so much interesting material, you know, to, to uncover. And I, I thought, let me just talk to a group of people like one you know, person at a time. And originally this was right before COVID. Um, I thought maybe I'd talk to 70 or 75 people and it went, went down to 40 because I just couldn't talk with that many more during that time and some were in person. So I couldn't do any more in person. So I spoke to people, you know, individually um, just to ask them about anything in their life that meant something to them that stays with them from childhood or what they're going through. Or it can be any kind of feeling. It could be positive. It could be, you know, not easy. It could be beautiful. It could be, you know frightening. It could be anything. And people opened up and said so much. And I had incredible stories. Somebody was, their parents were trying to get over the border. They were, um, they were coming from Serbia and they were getting shot at. And she was a baby and she remembers hearing the noise and everything. I guess she wasn't an infant, but she was probably under one, but somehow that stayed with her. Wow. Like she just has like some kind of distant memory of that. And it was a uh, very, um, it was more than amazing because I feel like people are affected, you know, the way you grow, the way you come out of something, it only comes about because of what you were close to. Hmm. So, um, and the experiences of our family situations and personal struggles, and then there were hopes and dreams. And I just felt like I had so much to work from. So I titled, you know, each of the parts, I wrote four movements and, um, I want to reapply for, um, another grant either f from the arts council or, a bigger arts council I'm going to be doing. This is like one of my ongoing projects. So I could do a much larger scale, maybe from, you know, this Mount Vernon is a city. So I would do, a, a, you know, a larger scale, um, you know, an area, maybe upstate New York or somewhere where um, it's very different than living in a city, a very different story. Oh, sure. 
Yeah, grant writing can be a part-time job. <laughs> oh, yes, right. I would probably have some help. But yeah, I did this one on my own. I was very happy to get this because it, it started the ball rolling in the direction, you know, that I want to go. And in all my ensembles, all my collaborative work is um, so meaningful to me because I, I went to Manus College of Music and I became, um, you know, it was the first time I really started playing chamber music aside from like flute trios and flute quartets, but with mixed instruments. And I said to myself, this is what I want to do. One on a part, collaborating, because it's about people. You hmm. have to get along. You have to talk to each other and you have to decide things together. You have to make, you know, decisions musically. And then also just getting around things and agreeing on tempos and things like that. And as, to quote Samuel Barron, who's one of my teachers, I um, I remember reading, he said, um, you rise above yourself because you have to get along and you have to work as a group and think of the group being above you. Hmm. So, um, and I like that. I like that so much. I like that on many levels. Yeah. So, no, I couldn't agree more. And I love that quote. Oh, yeah, I do too. I love Sam Barron. He was just wonderful. Um, he was he was like a scientist, you know, working with him. Uh, it was fantastic. He had these approaches, like if there were certain things I needed help with or I wasn't able to surmount something. Um, and I was in my early to mid-20s when I studied with him. He would just lay out things so simply and it was so effective and so great. He had this approach and he was kind of like, you know, you think of a professor, you know, who's really, really you know, is way above the cut of intelligence of many. And uh, he was like that, but he was so caring and he was just such, such a great guy and uh, so musical, but so practical at the same time. Hmm. So in, in certain ways, just it was great working with him. Yeah, but I've heard that he was very practical. That's, I definitely have heard that from other former students of his. So that's interesting to make that connection mm -hmm. for me. Oh, yeah. It, yeah. It's it's wonderful. He was just a great guy. And um, I remember I had an audition and I, I, he was one of the jurors and I was so excited to play for him. And then I got very rare for me, but I got really sick. I think I was still in college and I was auditioning for some summer thing. And I went and I, you know, I had a like 103 fever and I felt kind of nauseous. And I just said, I'm going to do this because I really want it. And I played OK. It wasn't my best. And then I had written to him about being sick um, and I didn't hear back. And then after I got the rejection, I wrote to him again and he wrote back to me and he wrote such a lovely letter. I just thought he was such a gentleman about that. And he felt terrible. He doesn't know how that happened. You know, the moment of absent mindedness happens to everybody. So uh, Sam Barron, just I have the highest regard for him and, and for my other teachers. I had quite a few so yeah, you did. <laughs> I, did. <laughs> I did. I feel like, oh, my gosh, you know, because I started studying as a kid. I started playing when I was five for the first time I was playing. I was five years old when I first learned I had um, there was a day camp and there was just a music director there. And I just actually uh, my parents kind of picked flute for me. Mm -hmm. So uh, I remember being at a concert with them and, and my dad saying, look at the flutes. Wouldn't you like to play flute? And I thought, oh, they look nice. They're shiny. <laughs> so I said yes. And then a few years later, um, cello came along and I said, oh, I, I was dying to play cello. So I started in school and, you know, like second grade and it was big and heavy and I didn't know how to play it. And I was learning, but it felt so slow compared to the flute because I already could play flute. You know, I, I, I knew how to play and I could do a lot of things at that age, you know. Um, and so I just stuck with the flute. And who knows what my career <laughs> would be like now if I was a cellist instead of a flutist. Yeah. Um, but it's exciting. Oh, cool. Um, think about that. And I come from a musical family, you know, uh, just my background and uh, I have two brothers that are very gifted, and they both play piano professionally. And one, um, he accompanies ballet dancers all the time at all these studios in New York, and now he's in Seattle working there. And um, he taught me a lot of things, I, I, you know, just about theory, and, and we've collaborated. I, I was out in Seattle a few years ago. And uh, he was a company of class and he asked me to join him. So I had to follow him. And because of the choreography, the rhythm had to change. The tempos had to change. The keys changed. He just did this. And he was like, 
I got such a great compliment. It meant so much to me because he's so gifted. My other brother and I believe that he's the most talented of the three of us. So <laughs> when he complimented me, that meant so much. You know, he said, well, you follow me really well. And I was like, OK, all that studio work wasn't for nothing because you sort of have to, you know, yeah. be ready to do whatever anyone asks you to. Yeah. That's cool that you came from a musical family. It sounds like it really inspired you and laid out that foundation for the rest of your career. Uh Completely. I always knew I would be a musician. It wasn't like I decided, and I never thought about this until one day somebody came along and said, after a concert or something, I think they said, when did you decide, you know, to to be a flutist or to be a musician? Hmm. And I said, um, and I didn't know what to say because I never really made the decision. I just understood that's who I was and what I was going to do. Yeah. I said, oh, I just, just yeah. sort of understood I would be a musician. I never had to explain that or, or address that before. <laughs> so that's exciting because I think we're all on a path. And some a lot of kids, you know, are in touch with themselves in a way they know what they can do. Mm-hmm. They understand their strengths and they definitely know what they can't do or they think they can't do. And um, I like to encourage, you know, people, you know, to explore something if they feel passionately about it. Mm-hmm. Don't give up before you try, mm-hmm. you know, especially when you're young. When yeah. you have that time. Um, and so that that is that's true. My family, um, I, I wonder if I would have been a musician if I was raised by, you know, another family. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll never know. I had a cousin also who was a very famous violinist, uh, Michael Rabin, mm-hmm. and uh, he would come over a lot. And um, I was amazed when when I asked him to play something on the piano, he said, oh, I can't play piano. And all of my brothers and I, the three of us had piano lessons and I said, you can't play piano. He was such a brilliant violinist and such a great, sweet, wonderful person. Mm-hmm. And I just, that just was such a surprise to me. I can still remember that. But his mom played piano. So uh, she would accompany me uh, playing Handel sonatas in high school. And that was fun. Mm. You know, had that. So, you know, I think um, also my mom's side of the family had other musicians. So that just, um, it was inspiring. And it kind of... Um, It was a good fit in terms of like, (laughs) you know. Yeah. No, I love that. And everyone's journey is so different because I've talked with a lot of different flutists uh, these past three years. And sometimes they say, you know, how they found their career and their niche was sometimes their stories are, oh, I just had a light bulb moment. I heard Beethoven's Aurora and I knew I wanted to be a flutist. And so like for them, it was a specific moment and others it's like, well, that's just who I am. And (laughs) right, right. yeah, so that sounds like the latter is true for you. Yes, that's true. Very true. And it's kind of exciting because then when you hear things, you know, there are certain things that I just feel, oh, these are another part of my world. I'm already in that world, Mm. but I always wanted to travel in that world. You know, I never, I never not wanted to be a musician. Mm. Yeah, no. And I resonate with that because same for me. My mom was a pianist. My dad was a percussionist. And they didn't play at the professional level, but it was there. It was just in their DNA. And same thing. They both wanted to be, you know, educators. Uh, My dad wanted to be a math teacher and my mom wanted to be an English teacher, but they didn't finish college. So Uh that was brought into my upbringing, you know, education, music. They were there, but they didn't do it for a living, but it was ingrained in me. And so then naturally... I just became this music educator. And it's like, (laughs) was that my, I mean, it just felt right. And of course I chose it, but it almost felt like it was predestined for me too. Like I'm almost fulfilling that musical side, that educational side that they didn't get to complete. And so I I often wonder like how much of that was mine (laughs) or was it, do you know what I mean? (laughs) Yes, yes. That's a great question because you're always feeling like, is this because of me or, or not, you know, yeah. what, do I have any, um, you know, do I get any merit? Yeah. <laughs> for doing this? But I'm sure they're very proud of you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, no, it's just it. And I think some of these things are just meant to be, but then it does feel like a nice, well fit glove, you know? And so, um, yeah, I, sure. I only share that because there's a lot of things that you just said that I resonate with. And um, I love it. That's great. Yeah, it's great when you have that same, you know, understanding. It's just it's just there. Yeah. 
No, that's so cool. Is there anything else with your studies or your musical background that you want to share with the listeners? Oh, sure. I, um, I had a lot of music in my house, as I mentioned, you know, growing up, uh, my brothers both had rock bands and that influenced my preference and my enjoyment of hearing and being closer to different styles of music. Um, they each had a band and it was all over the place. One of them played, um, Motown, um, and there are some originals that they wrote and, um, the variety was incredible. There was Jimi Hendrix, you know, there was Percy Sledge. There, I don't know if this makes, you know, if there are any names of these artists are familiar. Um, but I loved hearing everything I heard. There was nothing they played that I didn't love, whether it was, you know, Beatles or you can name almost any artist from that time. Hmm. Um, and they covered at least one song of theirs. They won my middle brother's band, won Battle of the Band. So I always wanted to be a musician because I liked so much music, not just playing the flute, but being able to enjoy more than classical and Mm. other styles and to be close to people that were playing different music because uh, they're, you know, it's all the same language, all the different styles of Mm. music. They're just like different dialects of one bigger language is that's how I see it. And so um, later in high school, I went to Manhattan School of Music for the pre-college division. Um, And I studied with a a wonderful woman named Eleanor Lawrence, who um, was a strong proponent of Marcel Moise, of his uh, French school of flute playing. He was like the last living legend at that time. And so I took master classes with Marcel Moise, and he was just he just taught so well. He explained so well. He was so passionate about tone, about color, about the line. And uh, he was already um, quite old at that time when I took these, you know, a few different classes from him. And there were different people playing. And I remember a group played a, a quartet and they were at the beginning of the master class. And then by the end of the class, everyone had, you know, all the performers played, the students all played different things. And, um, I, you know, I played W.C. Serenx, so he told me that he put the bar lines in that piece. And then at the very end, he called up the flutist in the quartet and said, bar 12, what you did in this bar 12 isn't right. It's a mistake. You should do it this way. Like he just held on to that, remembered exactly what it was with no music in front of him at a very advanced age and was able to just pinpoint that. It was just, um, he was amazing. And he was a big influence because I love playing long tones. I make my students play long tones. Mm -hmm. And I actually had a very interesting experience. It's kind of funny. I was playing long tones one day and um, I actually fell asleep and started dreaming. And it was very short. It could have been a few seconds, probably. And I woke up and I was still holding the note and everything was fine. And I thought, wow, I wonder in biofeedback what that would do, you know, how you would see that in a loop or in a graph of your brainwave. Yeah. While you're actually doing something like playing. That's yeah, crazy. That <laughs> is. <laughs> yeah. You went so, into almost a trance. Perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was like a a flute trance. Yeah, well, that's what they say, you know, the piper. (laughs) Yeah, right. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so that was pretty cool. I've never done it again. It's never happened to me. I feel like it happened. I was playing and I was just so zoned in that part of my brain just went away. So the rest of it could be, you know, focused on just that. Yeah. How that works. I wonder what it, you know. Yeah, where it went. Yeah, neuros, like, um neurology where somebody who you know in that field might say what that is yeah you know, that is that interesting happen. yeah it was crazy <laughs> but you know, there's, yeah. there are so many things to, to talk about with you oh my um, gosh yeah there are <laughs> we could be on this call for two hours easily yeah right I won't do that to you because I know how precious your time is but that's amazing. I love hearing your background. And um, at what point did you start picking up composing? Um, that's interesting. Okay, so I started composing a little bit as a kid. I, I wrote little piano melodies because I was studying piano, I guess. Um, and I was hearing a lot of piano in my house. But I would just have these, you know, little things go through my head and I would start like humming them. And I'd be in the car, like driving. My parents would be driving us to, you know, 
our piano lessons, which we had at my grandparents' house. So I had a lot of time to think about, you know, things. You're in the car, so you're not caught up in other stuff. So I'm just daydreaming. And then I'd write these little melodies down. Later in high school, I wrote some flute duets. And then in college, I wrote a brass quintet. But um, I wasn't composing actively at that point because I was going as a performer, as a performance major. So all my energy and my focus was going to practicing, rehearsing, having the lesson, performing, and preparing, you know, for juries and things and, and recitals. And then later on, it, it came about um, about 11 going on 12 years ago. Um, I got a phone call from a really incredible musician who's also been and has since has become an engineer for my first um, original CD project. And um, he was forming a group and someone he just called someone in his area that he knew she was a harpist. And then he said he was, you know, wanted to have like four people in this group to compose music for each other and to be like, you know, a f have a format of like a working ensemble of composers, musicians mm -hmm. playing each other's work and probably other work. And uh, so she said, oh, you know, um, and then he mentioned my name and she said, oh, she's a good friend of mine. So um, we were talking, he and I, his name is Barry Hartglass, and he was wonderful. And um, he heard a little bit about some things I was doing. And he said to me, you should write, don't judge, just write. And that was the best advice at that point in time that he could have given me. So I like within days, I was sitting in my dining room and I heard this melody and I said, that's really cool. Mm -hmm. So I started, I didn't, I didn't do um, Sibelius, I didn't do software or anything then. So by hand, I started writing this all down and then I stopped and I was horrified. I said, this is somebody else's, this has, this can't be mine. Where is this coming from? I sure hope no one says you stole my music. You know, I have that. <laughs> oh my <laughs> goodness. That. Yeah, I have that. It happens. It's kind of funny. You worry, it's like, is this really mine? Uh, did I steal this? But I didn't know it because it was just there and came through me. I feel like a medium, uh -huh. you know, and it's funny. Um, so that began, that sort of opened a door and I began composing a lot. I had more than enough material for my first CD. And then um, I wrote more and um, I wrote a, a second a, a original CD. So I, again, I love collaborating and I picked artists who were, I felt like were so wonderful to work with. They were just so creative and they were such wonderful players and open to doing things like this. So I had those two CDs and from each one, um, I have pieces that I particularly like um, and they both involve flute, hmm. although different instruments. Uh, so from out of all this composing came Coniferous Forest, hmm. which was... Um, that was a wonderful commission from Englewoods, which is, um, they're from Englewood, New Jersey, but they're called Engle Winds. Hmm. And so they commissioned me to write something, um, a nature theme of water. Hmm. And I thought that was a great theme and that works so well. Um, they're an eco-friendly group. So coniferous forest was using imagery in my mind. I use that to create lines and the music. So I saw a beautiful green forest in winter and all the evergreens had the conifers they all had snow and it was starting to melt so each bit of water would you know like a little drop would swirl round and round and round till the bottom of of the uh part of the evergreen until it plopped into the snow hmm. and at one point i use a bass flute with like tongue thrusts or tongue rams and that would be the snow plopping hard mm. into this you know the the melted snow dropping into the bank of snow on the ground and so that's um that's a piece i, I really enjoy that's gotten a lot of um good feedback how people. creative yeah it's it's yeah <laughs> yeah it's fun though but a theme i mean if um you know i know you often ask i think you asked me about my creative process earlier yeah and um it works wonderfully when there's a theme, but I basically can create from a personality or a theme or an image, or it could be a place where there's something special to me or something I'm aware of about it or something I sense. Mm. And um, it kind of happens like I 
sort of just switch channels. I just okay. go to another channel and it's very solitary. Um, but I feel like I'm going somewhere. I'm sort of leaving. Like there's no gravity. There's no time. There's no physical plane anymore. And I'm just almost like it's coming through me in a, in a way that I still think, oh, my God, a few years later, maybe you know, I'll still get someone <laughs> calling me up, or sending me a letter. <laughs> That's not your music. <laughs> hasn't happened yet yeah. but it's very funny you wow. know I, that, that never goes away with that what, so what I want to say with that what what that reminds me of is kind of this nugget in Elizabeth Gilbert's book um, I think it's called Big Magic oh yes so you mentioned that yeah your... it's a book that um, I really love about the creative process but here you're talking about you know this melody is just coming through you and you're like wait, is this even mine? It reminds me of what she talks about how if something like, you know, literature or a poem or music wants to be created, it's out there in the energy, out in the air, and it will go to, say, Jane, Joe, and say, will you create me? And wow. that thought, <laughs> that, oh, that's that, so cool. isn't that cool? <laughs> that thought will be yeah. there and Jane will go, oh, I can't deal with that idea or that motive or that melody, you know, come back later. And so it needs to be formed and created and given birth per se. And so yeah. it will travel and it will ask Joe, what about you? And he'll say, no, sorry, I don't have time. And then well, maybe, it'll, yeah. it'll go to Pam. <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? So maybe yes. in a weird yes. way, this is kind of the experience you are experiencing. Yes, it's like a time travel. It's almost like you're connecting with someone. This might sound morbid, and I don't mean it this way. <laughs> That's in my mind. Um, you know, like somebody passes on, and you're communicating with them. Hmm. Through. But I've had that happen, though, in dreams, where I've had things that, um, before anyone knew that I've dreamt about that turned out to be true. So, like, huh. you are a medium. You're time traveling. You're just going, you know, you're an open vessel. Yeah. And so, like you're saying, it goes through you. Yeah. So whether it's um, a psychic experience or it's it's a musical flow or a receptive, you know, vessel for sounds, for images and things, it just, um, it happens that way. Hmm. Huh. Yeah, I just yeah. talked with Jared Tate yesterday, and he's a Native American composer. And we were talking about how, for him, he perceives time as not, there is no such thing as time. Like Mozart is still in the room with us when we are learning Mozart or Beethoven. Oh, and, love it. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. And when please. we, yeah. And when he says, when I pass on, I'm still with my son because I gave him those lessons. And it's this constant continuum. And there's just not like, yeah, we claim like, oh, I mean, we say 1600 to 1750 or whatever the dates are, are the broke period, right? Mm -hmm, and then right. so we we categorize things. But to him, he was talking about how time is endless and it, there's no past, present, future. It's just this big ball. Loop. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's a like loop. a loop, like yeah. a figure eight where it just keeps flowing, you know, from side to side hmm. and crossing. Wow. You know, it's like an eight on its side. <laughs> So, but I've, I've seen that before. I've, I've, I've heard that conception of time. And I, I like that because you feel like it, everything's open then. Mm. And it's not, you know, like death isn't so final, for example. Oh, I mean, that's yeah. not a great example. But <laughs> the flow of time is something that's constant. So it's sort of like you're going through a, a plane. Yeah. You know. Exactly. I should put you in touch with Jared. I think you two would have a lot oh, to talk about. I would love that. I would love to talk to Jared. Yeah. Um, please. <laughs> Feel free. Oh, yeah. So you talked about your compositional process, and I hear that you have a certain image or an emotion. You tap into, you know, this magical place that we just described. Right. Is there anything else that you want to say on this topic before we move on? Oh, sure. Um, okay, so it's a it's a series of details, and sometimes they come closer to me when I'm writing, and it'll be it's all there. Whether it's um, you know images or colors, I I have some mild synesthesia, so that also 
means that I want to write in specific keys for several reasons, one of them being the color. And and so it, it's a concept, it's a kind of a, a shape that can be um, the nature of a sound, an idiosyncrasy. It can be so many things that that will cause that the piece to come through, you know, to be reconstructed from some other part of the universe and put together as a, you know, specific piece of music mm. like that. Yeah. No, that's really cool. I like asking composers or performers, any creative artist, what their process is like, because mm -hmm. it just shows, I don't know, everyone's unique, not strategy, but unique process and what he or she does, you know, to, to produce X composition or X artwork. And to me, it helps to remind myself that there are steps like, I'm such a person where it's like, oh, I had this idea. Why isn't it done? <laughs> like, where's, like, where's the final right. product? Do you know what right. I mean? <laughs> okay, but, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's different. Um, it's a different state. Yeah, I, I, I'm already there. I'm already at the end result. And like, okay, yeah, I, I want a new website. Come on, snap my fingers. Let's, you know, get it done in half a second. But to Great. hear, but yeah, right. <laughs> if it was just all that easy, but to hear how, oh, I do this and then I do that and et cetera. It just reminds all of us that as we look at people like you and we don't mean to, but we put you on pedestals because uh -oh. you've <laughs> <laughs> no, because you accomplish so much in between your albums, being a performing artist and a composer and a grant winner, and the list goes on and on, a teacher, we think, mm -hmm. oh, well, yeah, of course, that's easy for Pam, because that's Pam. Look at, you know, her versatile career. But then oh. to hear, <laughs> but then to hear, like, even the Pams of the world have to scratch <laughs> out every note. Do you know what I mean? It's, yes, right, right. It's, it's just a good reminder for students, amateurs, pre-professionals, professionals alike that there is a process. Oh, there's a process, but I think everyone has, and I've heard this before, and I'm not sure whose quote I'm, I'm using, but everyone, I, maybe it's um, everyone has creativity, and it's a matter of how important it is to use that to express yourself. Some people are much more technical and can go into IT, mm. and, which I'm terrible at. <laughs> the other side <laughs> of the brain, I guess, or another part of your head. Um, so it, it makes a very big difference um, to know that, all right, you've got something to work with. Mm. But it can't be forced. It really can't be. Mm. It has to happen. These things that I've done, I feel like I haven't really done them. They sort of happen to me. And then I was guided. So it was a way how it was going to do. And then I make decisions like who's, you know, what's going to happen um, with the instrumentation here mm. or the articulation, or <clears throat> I want to harmonize it this way, but I only have three instruments. So then you figure out all the logistics of it and the practicality of physically playing it. But in terms of the actual musical sequence, it's like a painting. You just take a brush and you just draw a stroke. Hmm. And then the shape of that stroke changes as the ink, you know, where the paint leaves the brush. So there's less paint at the end of the stroke hmm. on the canvas, yeah. depending on how you do that. And um, I don't even name things first anymore unless it's a theme. Mm. And then I can have a name in mind for that theme. But the music sort of takes me somewhere. And then I have a title because I realize this is what this is meant to be. Mm. So and that happens with artists, too. And when painters paint, they say, you know, the paint will take you. Yeah. So then it, it's that way. So it's not like the humans have all the control. It's it's more like a an inner, you know, part like a spirit, something hmm. leading. It's a very it's wonderful. I, I love being able to do it. But you, you need a block of time, not not a whole lot, <laughs> but just enough like to get to a certain point where you feel like you can then go forward from there when you come back. That makes sense. Yeah, I love how you're sharing all of that. And it sounds like a, I want to tap into that part of your world and go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just don't go out outside of it. That's yeah. a whole world. <laughs> yeah, it's great though. But it's all, it's all part and parcel of being a musician to me. Mm. Like when people say, um, you know, profession, I don't write flutists, I write musician because I'm a musician and I think all flutists need to be and want to be and are many, of course, so many are, you know, bigger than their instrument. 
there, you know, you have musicianship and then you have creative things, whether you do that, how you work with your students or how you work in a group or how you are able to learn repertoire and play it so beautifully hmm. and collaborate things uh, all across the board. So it's, it's all different parts of the same soul, mm. you know, yeah. living in the world. I and, love that. So being a composer and as a musical performer, do you feel like the two complement each other where your your skills are enhanced? That's a great question. Um, it's actually performing led me to composing, even though when I first was a little kid doing that, because I was playing piano, but not on any serious level, like, like you know, seven or eight. Um but I feel like what happens is um, the biggest help has been with improvisation. Um, writing music has helped me improvise and the other way around. So I play in two groups um, that are playing outside of classical music, but they're also um, using different styles. One of them is we're playing some sambas, originals that are kind of pop, rock, folk, mix, uh, roots, uh, a little R and B, you know, mixed up with some light jazz, blues certainly, and um, I just improvise with this group. This is one of my groups, and um, it just things just sort of appear. It's sort of like you just see a space, and there's light, and there's like things moving, and you just start playing. And it's but it's in your ear. You're mm. seeing it, but it's like what's in your ear. It's like my wires are crossed, and you know, people with synesthesia have, you know, have some very bizarre connections. I, I met someone else who. Um, uh, synesthesis, I think it's called. And she, um, she tasted color when she ate, she was having colors and that was weird. That was like, weird. that's not really hated eating, wow. but that's, that's the brain. Yeah. Wild. I mean, looking and seeing color and hearing color, of course, that's, you know, when you have chromaticism and you're showing all, it's like a peacock opening all the feathers, you have the whole, you know, scope and the, the spectrum of color yeah. You know, but then when you play chromatically, yes, you have that too in the tones. Huh. You know, even with microtones, it, yeah. it, there's still little places and different shades of the color. Um, so it, <laughs> that's wow. what it is. But yeah, to answer the rest, of, to address the rest of your question, yeah. I feel like what happens is um, I, I don't know yet if I play differently, like if it's classical music, if I'm phrasing any differently because I'm composing mm. I feel closer to a composition mm. um in a certain sense maybe because I'm writing maybe it's because I'm also now a composer but um I don't consider myself like huge I mean I write chamber music for unusual combinations of instruments mm. so um so to answer that yes yeah. definitely there are things that benefit other aspects of the playing and writing. Yeah, I kind of, you know, when I write out these questions and think of, you know, our upcoming dialogue between me and the guest, I I kind of suspect or kind of predict what the guest might say. And sometimes I'm totally blown away by the answer. <laughs> sure. <laughs> like colors and senses and sounds, you know, coming to you. That blew me away. I was not expecting that answer. Uh -huh. But I was thinking that you might have said something along along the lines of improvisation. Because um, mm -hmm. my husband is a blues rock guitarist. And he's right. always like, how do you improvise? How do you improvise? You know, write out the lick, write out what you hear, because that's going to make you a better flutist. And so mm -hmm. I was thinking that seeing your different albums between jazz and, you know, all these different genres and hearing your improvisatory solos, just knowing composition on that level, it has to enhance you as a performer. I, I get, yeah, I would believe that. Yeah. I, I don't know, like, I don't find it amazing, but I'm very self-critical. I'm terrible. Okay. I, I'm glad I'm not a critic. I'd probably destroy somebody. <laughs> um, it's really very bad, not not what I want. But I just, I do feel like it means so much to me to be able to do the things I want to do. But I always feel like I have so much more room for growth. I could keep growing forever. I mean, that's the idea, you know, is that you want to keep keep fulfilling a goal. You don't actually reach it. You sort of go through it and then you're in a different you know, level or a different place than you were 
earlier, Mm -hmm. but it's the experience and it's also the sounds. After a while, hearing certain instruments change you. Mm. Listening to harp is very different than listening to a lot of heavy drumming. You know, it's like different reactions in your physiology with everything. Mm. Yeah, that reminds me of um, a dear friend of mine is Kathy Blocky and uh-huh. uh, the inventor of the Numo Pro. Right. And she had a shop or an exhibit booth up at one of the NFA conventions. And she said that Wally Kujala came by and he was watching Kathy blow on the Numo Pro and stuff. And um, as well, oh my gosh, his career too. <laughs> It's a whole nother plane. Um, and yeah. the amazing performer that he is and everything, he watched her and he said, oh, I think I want to reconsider the shape of my embouchure. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> right. That's great. Right. right. Isn't that funny how things sort of click when you see in the right circumstance, a point in time, something that connects you and yeah. you just know it. But if you don't see it or you don't connect with that, um, it doesn't come yeah. You know, necessarily. But his son is amazing, too. Oh, Steve. I love Steve. Yeah, yeah I do, too. <laughs> but to hear that with, you know, considering his age and his experience, yes. to me, <laughs> right. as a rookie <laughs> over here, I'm like, that's humbling. If Mr. Kujala is saying, oh, I can find ways to improve still at my age, then yeah. I have a lot of work to do. <laughs> well, that keeps you healthy. Yeah. I think, you know, you're open to, to wanting to, you know, move in a direction that's, you know, beyond or continuing it in a different way, mm. you know. Yeah, I, I agree. And the same notion of being in that practice room and thinking, oh, why, why can't I still get that triple tonguing? But if you think it's this never ending or life is this never ending field of possibilities of new concepts or older concepts to perfect and it's this continuum, then then there's no judgment. It's more like, oh, okay, I'll get mm-hmm. it. I'll keep working at it. But do you see what I'm saying? I do. Yeah. Yes. It's very nice when you're not feeling that the absence of restriction is just a beautiful thing. Mm. There's so many constraints put upon us with time, especially, and with what's expected and producing or, um, you know, every step of the way. You know, there's more expected or there's supposed to be followed by something. And that puts pressure and that is um, that hinders that hinders the process, Hmm. you know, and also takes away the joy or it it can, you know, can take away some of the joy. Certainly. Oh, yeah, for sure. I love it. So let's shift gears a little bit here and let's talk about your performance career. So you have, my goodness, have been a musician on so many different albums. First, I don't know the studio world. Do you audition for every album or are you contracted through a certain label and then they hire you out? No, it's not quite like that. It's um, there are contractors like there are for orchestras, for example, musical contractors and, um, I originally was working with a wonderful arranger and composer named Don Sebesky, who wrote um, movie scores and many, many jingles and helped people on projects. And I actually played for a few of his classes when he was teaching. Um, it was in Lincoln Center. He had a, a class in one of the rooms. And uh, it was uh, a wonderful experience to work for him. And he wrote such great stuff. So then somebody on the sessions that I was seeing uh, started producing their own jingle. So they asked me and then someone else heard me and it kind of goes through that way. But then it it led to the contractor who's been calling me. There were two contractors more recently that were calling me in the past. um, Gosh, how many years? More than 10. Although, you know, it's kind of a hiatus with, you know, this virus. So, um, but until then um, and before, especially earlier than that, um, I was getting asked to play for different artists and I would just play on the the CDs, whatever the the albums rather. Hmm. um, So that you would hear, um, you know, if it was a group of flutes or was a flute in a full orchestra. And it was exciting because some of the artists that came in um, were very well known. Hmm. Um, And I loved working with 
with everyone. It was always something to take away with me that was an experience that, you know, became part of who I am. It was like an awareness of how people behave and how people write and how they are to work with. And you see the interaction. Um, like I've had, um, it was Natalie Cole was just wonderful. I'm on two of her recordings. And mm. she just came in and she was in this, you know, the engineering in the room um, with the engineer. And we were all listening back. And she said, oh, you all just sound so beautiful. You're just so wonderful. And everyone took a deep breath. It was so nice to hear that come from the person for whom we're working. Mm. It's not always like that. Usually people are very cool. And they're, if they're there, they're, they're very happy because I, they were always fantastic players. They were mostly people from the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra. Mm. So I, it was beautiful for me to play with them because they were just there was nothing they couldn't do hmm. in in that orchestral setting so it, it made it it was a, with ease that you could play in in that level of playing with that level of playing hmm. yes so with players like that you know it just sort of went you know it just went across the board but sometimes you have someone um in the studio and there, like one time there was a conductor was doing Shaft uh, 2000, hmm. and it was like three days of just recording bits for the film. Hmm. And that's harder because you can't just ex do excerpts. You have to do a whole scene. Yeah. So you could play perfectly, and then the last note isn't right, so you got to go back <gasps> and do this. And that was at Sony, you know, at the soundstage. And so this conductor was angry. He said, oh, it was terrible. And I don't want to go into it, but um, yeah. everybody was tense. He was had a hard time with some of the strings, which they were amazing players. So I don't know what he was hearing. Yeah. Um, and then the third day, another guy came in. I don't know if, what happened if someone said something and they let him go, <laughs> or maybe he had to go back to LA or someone else, you know, yeah. changed their mind there. So what happened was there was another conductor comes in and he goes, okay, we're going to record this and we're just going to put it to bed. Nice. Claps his hands. And we all went, thank God, <laughs> you know? And so it just, it's like, you know, your vibe can take over the whole room and mm. make it harder. That's like the energy thing. You don't want to hinder that mm. because you, you limit the flow there. You're tense. That's just the anathema to, to playing beautifully. And, and like, you know, as a flutist tensing your shoulders yeah. or, you know, or your back or something, you know, that's doesn't work for you ever. Um, yeah. so it, it's like that. So different contractors lead to different, um, opportunities. Okay. And, uh, then I began collaborating, um, with some of the people that I, I met on sessions. Um, and then I ended up, uh, well, I don't know what you want to ask me next. So I can keep <laughs> going. So I'll wait for you. <laughs> no, that's wonderful. Thank you for telling me that process. Um, yeah. Cause if you don't know, you don't know. So it's good to right. have that insight. Um, so I'm curious, I'm sure that some of the soloists might be in this studio recording booth with y'all, but mm -hmm. are some soloists, uh, do you guys just record the track and then they later come in and sing over the musical track? Um, with the vocals, um, you'll hear, usually you'll hear the vocals. It's not necessarily the final track. It might just be something that they have, like a sketch, so that you hear what everything. You know, you have the options. Sometimes you just want to have it without the vocals or with. Hmm. It really depends on who's producing and how they, the, you know, the um, arranger or the composer writes in okay. this process of that. Um, so sometimes you hear them and that's good because if you have things in harmony with them, you want to get the rhythm perfect and obviously the pitch, right. um, but you want a reference point right. and so you can be great with the orchestra, but your line is paralleling in whether in thirds or six or in some different, you know, voice leading way, it, um, that it really helps. So you, you can hear what you're supposed to be doing in full. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I just didn't know if you actually got to meet all of the soloists like Tony Bennett and Natalie Cole. I oh, didn't, yes. Yeah. Right. No. How would you know? I mean, it's crazy. It goes on in a, in a studio. So not everyone's not watching. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's wonderful. I did get to meet Tony Bennett. Um, he was, oh my God, his, he had a magnetic personality. Huh. I went, you know, there were different people talking to him. And so someone saw me in the doorway and said, you know, like gently waving me. And so I went in 
And I just started to say, it's such a pleasure to work with you that I almost froze because it was so powerful. Yeah. And when you think about it, the length of his career, he's had an active career probably longer than anyone. Yeah. And he just recently, unfortunately, you know, had to stop. So, yeah. um, cause he's, he's not well, but he's also, I think it's he 92. I'm not certain exactly, mm. but he had a really super long career and he was just great. He had a very good ear. His son, Danny was engineering, was producing. Um, I'm not certain he was engineering, but he was producing uh, a couple of CDs, and I'm on three of his um, three of his albums. Hmm. So uh, it was great to work with him. And then Jorge Holandrelli um, was the conductor for that and the arranger, hmm. and uh, he was wonderful to work with. He was amiable, and it was just you know, it, it was pleasant. That's hmm. you know, you just wanted to be pleasant and comfortable and conducive to playing your best. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> one time, oh my God, you know, it's all over the place because you're dealing not just with classical orchestral musicians, you're dealing with a rock star. So there might be a little ego. Sometimes it can be with anyone. It doesn't, you know, it's not a judgment call. Uh, but for example, we went in and right before, you know, just like two minutes before like hit time, we heard someone yelling and it was nasty. He was insulting oh. somebody and we're like, oh, and then when the person walked in, that was whose record it was. Oh. And he was leading the session. So we all were like, oh my God, I hope he, you know, doesn't yell at me like that. You know, right? it was a small group, like I think nine or 10 of us at this one session. And, um, and I was like, okay, I really have to focus. Don't do anything. <laughs> you, know, you get like wow. nervous and then it's over. And then, so when you just feel the vibe, it's pretty much the same. Like we all think it's okay, but we're not sure until like we can, you know, hear the right thing. Mm -hmm. And then he said, oh, you all sounded great. And we all went, I heard everyone go, <laughs> like, you know, exhale. <laughs> so it really, um, you know, it's, that's, that's the business because time is money when you're in a studio like that. You don't want to, yeah. <laughs> I was going to ask, are they literally so stressed out because of the money factor that they just don't know how to handle that stress and blow up? Oh, I don't know. In this case, he was the star. I think he was, somebody was supposed to get him something and he was, you know, they didn't run the errand correctly. It sounded kind of like that's what okay. I think it was, but I'm not sure because we didn't hear much of it. We just heard the yelling and we couldn't hear all the words, but yeah. he definitely was very angry and it was really ugly to hear. Hmm. And then, um, but you know, sometimes like you're getting like the arrangers conducting and, you know, or whoever's leading the session, they have, you know, that time constraint because they have to pay, you know, if it's a full orchestra, they have to pay in 20 minute segments. So yeah. if you go a minute over, unless they all agree and say, oh, it's fine, you can have two extra minutes for nothing. It's, you know, union contract is like 20 minutes. So but it's different for different size groups. There's a lot of detail with that. So, you know, you're getting to the end of it. You sure don't want to be the one to make the mistake. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. You know, not at any point, but especially like that when it means, oh, my God, we have to do it. And then they want to, you know, for good luck, they do another pass. But it's exciting. I loved doing that. I did that for over th almost 35 years. Wow. So it was, it was exciting. It's a very different scene now. I mean, I think a lot of it mm. might come back, but so much of it has been outsourced, yeah. you know, oh, to yeah. countries, Eastern Europe, for example, Czech Republic. Uh, so that's amazing. Talk about high pressure. Yeah, Oof. it's exciting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Never a dull day. Right. Yeah. But I liked touring. Touring was fun, too. Speaking of other aspects mm. of, you know, what I've been doing. Um I loved working with Claude Bowling, for example, mm. and uh, Dave Rubeck and Jack Wilkins, Andrea Bocelli. It was just um, each experience was so meaningful mm. to me. Yeah. Tours. Yeah. No, that's so cool. Is there a particular tour? I don't know how you can choose because how do you choose from Bocelli versus Claude Bowling? But let's maybe focus on Claude Bowling since he just passed away recently. Yes, he did. You wrote a wonderful article and contributed some great quotes to the New York oh. Times. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, that was that just happened. I, I had heard from uh, his personal assistant that he had passed away. I got an email. And then the next day or so, I, or a couple of days later, uh, I received, uh, an, you know, a question from 
the person at the desk of the New York Times obituary column, uh, one of them, you know, if I could offer some quotes, what it was like to play for him and specific questions that were some were very interesting. And I had to Hmm. think a bit about how I would describe why his music was so vastly appealing for so many years. He was top of the charts for Billboard for Hmm. 10 years, a little bit more than 10 years. And um, basically, I just loved playing his music. I mean, the parts were written for Jean-Pierre Rampal, who recorded them, yeah. the suite, first suite and second suite. And then, you know, I, I came up with what I felt was the most resonant thing I could say about that. And then he had other questions. So I, I was happy that he included everything because it, I felt like I was close to him in a musical sense that I could say, OK, this is what it was. This is what he wrote. Like another like a critic was saying percussion, but it was drum. It was a trap set and there was light drumming. But, Hmm. you know, like just like details, you know, I was able to say alto flute and bass flute because not many people realize both of those flutes are included in his first suite, which Hmm. has seven movements. So it was like a way of paying tribute to him, of course, because he was just fantastic. And the flute world, we all love his piece. We all love to play it, right? Yeah. Every classical flute player wants to play that, or if they don't, then most of us do. Yeah. <laughs> and so when I, I had the opportunity to audition for him, I grabbed it, and that worked out really well. Yeah, then one of the people I also worked with on his tours, well, Claude Bowling was a guest of Hubert Laws, and I was a guest of Claude Bowling. So there were huh. some concerts, I believe it was in Chicago. Okay. Uh, not certain. It was in the Midwest. And so we're close to the Midwest. <laughs> and uh, so... Hubert said um, he wanted to include me, too, because he said, oh, there's things for two flutes. Let's do something from California Suite from, you know, one of his movies. And um, it was so nice and and gracious of Hubert to do that. And I feel like, wow, I was getting a bird's eye view of how someone is on stage, someone like with his stature, because he's classically trained, Hubert Laws. And um, he's famous as a jazz flutist, but he brings all the classical you know, smoothness, you know, of, of tone and style into into his jazz. And he's just a brilliant improviser. He's just so awesome. Hmm. Um, so I just felt like, wow. And he made nice comments about my playing. And I was like, so, <laughs> so happy to hear that um, because he, he's a cool person. And it, it's um, to work with musicians of that caliber, especially when they're in the jazz world and you are not. It's okay. eye opening in a beautiful way. Huh. Because I remember the first tour I did with Claude, uh, he had Larry Coriel, who was like a crossover, just like, well, not a crossover, he was a fusion guitarist. So he took rock um, and then, you know, pop and rock and jazz. It was really jazz and rock fusion, Hmm. actually. And um, he'd be laughing and talking on stage. And I remember thinking, wow, I love this. They can talk on stage. (laughs) How we're not allowed to do that as classical musicians. We sit there quietly. Only the conductor can say something, you know. And I just said, I want to do more of this. This is cool. I mean, I had listened to jazz and I had felt, you know, like I loved it. And I never thought of myself as playing jazz per se. But I did think that I wanted to include different styles, more styles than I already had been doing some playing. And and that was... um, just like a green light for me, Hmm. you know, feel that I could play in the style and I could phrase that way. And Hmm. it became more natural. And now if I listen to myself from back then, I still think, oh, I played that really well. But the phrasing wasn't the way I would do it now. Yeah. You evolve. Oh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I have a hard time listening to past recordings. (laughs) Uh, Yes, that is hard. Yeah. I love what you just said about all of these lessons that you've learned from these masters, how it Mm -hmm. goes back full circle to the beginning of the talk when you talked about how, you know, music from the seventies, like Jimi Hendrix, right. Had influenced you. (laughs) Very early seventies. Right. And then here you are. I mean, look what you're doing through your career. Yeah. Yeah. I I thank you. I I like to use all that. I think uh, like your friend, Jared, you know, yeah. um, there is no time. It's happening now. You know, Jimmy's yeah. still here. You know, people are listening to his music somewhere. Yeah. Um, but all that works really well because, again, um, nothing exists separate from everything else. Yeah. There's always everything is connected. And my feeling is that if I can play this style and I want to play that style, yes, I have to learn. I have to respect what there is, you know, the, the differences and to be able it's like a language 
you want the correct accent pronunciation and the right nuance. And, you know, when you put a sentence together, you want to use the correct structure, you know, which is different in different languages. Um, like no double negatives in English, but in Italian, you would have double. So yeah. um, I, I want to do that, too. Huh. I don't want to stop. I won't stop until I pass out yeah. or, <laughs> or whatever. And that's what I love about Jack Wilkins, who was a guitarist. He's a really, really consummate, amazing guitar player. He's like um, one of the finest guitarists, jazz guitarists, because he has such style. I, I told him once he was like a poet because I, I'm mentioning him because he was also a guest artist for a few years with Claude when I was the solo the flute solo and then he was a guitar soloist Mm. um uh and we've collaborated and it's so funny because he plays jazz but he loves to play classical Mm. i was playing classical and i wanted to play jazz so Mm. we got together you go oh so let's play some classical duets i go let's play some jazz (laughs) standards it was so funny (laughs) we each wanted to play a different kind of thing but we did we did both um he was wonderful to work with We've uh, played a couple of recitals and um, have been in touch since those tours, which were in the mid to late 80s mm. that I did with him after Larry Correa left. Mm. So, And then um, you mentioned uh, Andrea Bocelli. He, yeah. he played flute, too. He would always warm up before a performance. Uh, he'd be in the dressing room warming up on flute. Ah. And, uh, yeah, and then um, he would be singing. Then he would um, come out and... Um, it was just, it was nice. He just, you could tell he loved to sing. Wow. He really did. Is that a yeah. well-known fact or am I completely living under a rock? I no, didn't... no, no rocks. Um, okay. He, <laughs> no rocks. You're living out in the world. It's fine. He just did that, I think, for his own, you know, maybe connection with the throat and the singing and the way you use your throat when you play the flute, the shapes, okay. you know, certain notes and certain tones. Um, he... I won't pass any judgment. He he was not at a professional level. Okay. But you know, maybe he did things for his own projects somewhere we don't know about. Okay. I I just knew him as a tenor. I when you said he was warming up on the flute in the oh, backstage. Yeah, he would, yeah, he would do that too. He'd be in the studio and it was usually I think um there were a number of TV cable TV and national television also uh, appearances. Um often we would play to a track. Huh. And um, that was fine because we were still playing. We just had the track, you know, in the speakers and we play along with it, which was not my first choice yet. Um, it was great to observe someone and how we approached that, you okay. know, the uh, the process of recording. Wow. I'm you so know. jealous of like, in a good way, jealous, just hearing all of your stories with these amazing composers and performers from different musical genres and instruments and studio to on stage and tours i mean how special is your career oh it was fun it was fun i'm really grateful for all the forces that united that made that you know come about yeah some of the um some of the things i think if you know you know the expression if you want something done do it yourself yeah um that kind of happened um the way i met claude bowling because i have to mention i was playing in a group at that time and we had been a number of times on wqxr with back in the day with bob sherman in the listening room which is like now i'm revealing you know my my age and it doesn't matter because they had claude bowling at that time coming on as a guest yeah on Bob Sherman show. And when I heard that, I said, Oh my God, because I love the piece. I had actually a high school who's a friend now, but she was my nemesis at the time, not in any dramatic or bad way. I don't even know if she knew that that was the case, but I felt like, you know, I, I heard her play that piece and I said, I love this piece and I could do it better, which is human nature at its finest. Right. Um, So I called the station and they said, Oh, you know, and I, told them that, you know, the group and stuff, they said, oh, yes. And they seemed to recognize it. Maybe they were just being nice. Um, And they said, well, we can't give you his number, but we could give him your number. So I did. And he called me right away. And he said, well, he was going to hear some other flutists, but I could come too. And so I played for him. And um, he kept asking me back to play. And I came to rehearsals. He had different flutists. He was doing something with Herbie Mann. And then he asked me to do the first tour. And I was like, we did something in New York. And then he said the first tour. And I was like, Yes. 
<laughs> so yeah, I, you know, it was just great. It was just what I really wanted to play. I loved it at that point. I was not improvising. Mm. You know, this was uh, 1984 okay. was the first tour. So that was very exciting for me to do that. And then he wrote some improvisations. And then I began to improvise a little with something. And I thought it wasn't too bad. You know, the audience clapped pretty heartily. And I think maybe it was out of empathy. I don't know. Yeah. But, you know, when I listen, if years pass, when I listen back, I go, oh, ouch. <laughs> Like, no, lose that tape. That is that was not me. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that's part of, you know, you develop, you grow, you have to start somewhere. Yeah. That's really you have to start somewhere. And mm -hmm. I think um it's just um if you don't take the first step, you can't take a second step. Yeah. Very and true. If you want to get somewhere, it takes effort and time. Um, and that's fine because I had a really good journey going, you know, and most of these things getting to play with, you know some amazing outstanding artists hmm. and then doing my original cds too five different flutes and organ that's a piece called spell 166 hmm. which is from the ancient uh, egyptian um book of illumination which is they also call the book of the dead and i'm fascinated by ancient cultures hmm. totally native american for sure that was my first cd was a native american jazz tribute and this cd the second cd which includes spell 166 um, is a tribute, my original tribute to ancient Egypt. So that piece has piccolo, flute, two alto flutes, bass flute, and organ. Hmm. And um, I have a video of that online on YouTube, and it's got it's like a slideshow. Okay. With with the mute with the actual piece. Okay. It's, it's dramatic. Of course, I'm. I like drama. <laughs> <laughs> that. My goodness, Pam, this has been a lovely whirlwind. Of, <laughs> it, it is so exciting. I mean, seriously, but between your studio career, the performing, the tours, the compositional career, you just never stop. And I thank you for your immense amount of contributions to our community. Oh, I thank you, too. Thank you. I'm honored to be here because I enjoy your podcast and I'm amazed at how much you're doing. Oh, oh you're sweet. <laughs> Different directions. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this podcasting world has been a blessing and I'm learning lots and it's putting me in great uh, communion with new friends. And I just I couldn't have it or I wouldn't want it any other way. That's great. Yeah. That's really the best, you know, when you're immersed in that and you're happy in there and you're working hard, but you're, you know, you're going in the direction you're loving, you know, to see happen. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Flute 360 podcast. Please subscribe to the Flute 360 newsletter by going to HeidiKBegay.com. A pop-up will appear and you can enter in your information for the weekly newsletter. The newsletter includes great incentives, updates, and perks to the subscribers. Go ahead to HeidiKBegay.com and sign up today. Thank you.